conversation about MedShare, and I thought, um, Charles, you did a fantastic job, I think, of giving people a flavor of how complex this can be, how nimble we have to be, how opportunistic we have to be, and how networked we have to be. All the people that were, were, were calling us was because they knew about MedShare and they knew what we had to offer. Um, so what I wanted to do is I thought it would be helpful to go a little bit beyond disasters because that's only one of the things that we do. Um, it's high profile, it's a lot of attention, we all know about the disasters, and, and help people understand a little bit about how we operate in between disasters. Sure. Um, so Charles, can you tell us a little bit about where does the equipment come from? I get it when you know people are really concerned about a part of the US, Puerto Rico, and the need that they have and you know wanting to donate supplies. But a lot of things we do aren't aren't in the newspaper, aren't high profile. How do you collect this? Where does it come from? How do you make sure that it ends up going where it's needed? No, I mean, a great question. I, certainly our model has evolved over the years. I would say 20 years ago, we started out as what we call a surplus recovery organization, which basically meant we did a lot of partnering with local hospitals, uh, similar to what you have here. We continue to do that today, and we depend very heavily. And this is just surplus product that uh, is not expired, unopened. Uh, oftentimes, it's uh, due to some, reg some regulation, which prevents the hospital from reuse. And we provide, obviously, a more attractive uh, uh, opportunity for them to redeploy that product to help save lives. So, uh, but now we've involved to not only the hospitals, but we get product direct from manufacturers. A number of our partners provide uh, the product, and this could be a cosmetic defect on a box. Uh, it could be a manufacturing override. It could be where a new product has come out. Uh, and so we get all of this, and we've established a number of, uh, of products, but you know, one thing is clear that by and large, regardless of the source, it typically would end up in the landfill. Mm -hmm. And so we collect upwards of about two and a half million pounds of, of items that we're able to repurpose to help save lives. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I want to drill down on that a little bit. Um, years ago, I had a chance to go to Nicaragua and I visited a hospital that had received medical surplus supplies they were donated. And as a physician, I could look at this stuff and tell you that the reason why it was given away was because nobody was ever going to use it. Mm -hmm. Tubes that would go down to help people breathe that could have been used for an elephant instead of a human being. And I think that there's a lot of that that's going on in, in, this, do in this space of donating medical supplies sure. where people are, or organizations are well-meaning, but they're giving away stuff that ends up piling up in front of the clinics and not being used because it's not what they need. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how we're different in our system um, that allows uh, organizations to get what they need as opposed to what we want to give them. No, sure. First of all, that situation is uh, very unfortunate and we see it all too often where good intentions can have devastating impacts. Uh, and so one of the things that you know our model is, we refer to it as a is a pull versus a push model, uh, which basically means we allow our recipients to order from us exactly what they need. So all of our inventory is put into our, our database, our warehouse system, and when we uh, get an application, we vet it to make sure they're reputable and we have the funding. We give them a unique password that they're able to go in and see our inventory and select box by box. And so a thousand boxes roughly, you know, a thousand to 1100 boxes of supplies would go into the container. Uh, and then there's the equipment. Uh, the equipment is a little trickier because there's such high demand. If you can imagine, everybody would want all of the uh, biomed equipment. So we ask for their wish list. Uh, we take a look at it and we give that to the engineer. And he's evaluating that not only for our availability, but also their capacity to have the donation. Uh, what we find often, they want the shiny's toy, mm -hmm. but they don't have the things they need to support the shiny toy. And so we make sure that that is going to be a donation that they can handle. Uh, and we, we see this all the time. Sometimes they really want the electric beds, but the power grid is not stable enough. So the manual beds are just as effective. So uh, I take great pride of that, actually, to, to, to know that MedShare is one of those few organizations that really uh, focus on the dignity and respect, but also the usefulness of the donation and allowing you know recipients to order exactly what they need so we don't contribute to this issue of things piling up uh, that they cannot use. 
And uh, I think it would be helpful for people to know kind of uh, the variety of the shiny toys. Yeah. Uh, what kind? I mean, we talked about beds, but what else? What what other kinds of things are we making available to people? Yeah, sure. I mean, so so what we found is what they want and what they need often aren't alive. Uh, most with these these uh, very basic health systems, they all need. Uh, uh, a scale, a thermometer, and blood pressure cuff. Why? Because that sets the treatment protocol, right? And so what they do, they weigh you, they take the temperature, your blood pressure, and that kind of sets the stage. So those are typically the things they, they need, but what they often want are the shiny toys, I call them, the anesthesia machines, the ultrasounds, the infant monitors, the baby warmers, the fetal monitors, all those great things. In some cases, they're need. Uh, so we see a lot of that, but we also do wheelchairs, we do crutches, you've got gurneys, you have pads. And then there's a number of the consumable supplies like the uh, gloves, the masks, the shoe covers, the dressings, and things like that. So the array, if you name it, uh, if you've seen it in the hospital in some shape or form, uh, we have it. And, and like I said, it's, uh, we're just very appreciative of our donors who select MedShare to donate these items too because they know uh, we're going to uh, put it to good use. So it's interesting because these things have great value. They're, they're valuable here, right. but they're even more valuable in some of the areas where we send them. Um, how do you know when we send, say, an anesthesia machine that it actually ends up going to the hospital and get, getting used for anesthesia and not getting diverted in, you know, into the black market? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, obviously never foolproof, right, 100%, but we do do some things that I think uh, assures us that is happening. Number one, the upfront vetting uh, process that we use. So each applicant is vetted. We look them up to make sure they're reputable. Uh, we also do a lot of repeat donations, uh, which, which helps with that situation. And we ask for feedback. So each of the recipients have to send back, you know, photographs, stories, receive back surveys. But the one thing I think we do a lot of, which is perhaps even more effective, is we rely on in-country partners. So we have a lot of partners in-country that we would you know, work with and they assure us or they check and validate uh, that uh, the equipment and products are arriving. And, and where we have funding, you know, our, our preferred model is to go out and do a pre-assessment where we would send someone out to the hospital and help them identify what their needs. We would ship it in probably 30 days after that follow up the pulse assessment where we are validating the correct installations, the usage, and, and verifying that those items are getting you know, where they should be. So that's one problem with all this stuff. The other problem with all this stuff is it breaks down. Sure. And, um, and I think another unique thing, in addition to the fact that we have this ability to uh, you know, barcode the stuff that we get and have people order what they want, uh, I think the biomedical program is another example of a differentiator. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and maybe give us some examples of where it actually extended the life in the field of sure. a shiny object that we were able to help donate. Yeah, and thanks for mentioning barcodes. I just glazed over that. But that, <laughs> you know, a lot of people walk in our warehouse, they go, whoa, everything is barcoded, it's location. You know, it's, it's truly a logistics. And we have some great logistics partners that have helped us, you know, with that. But I think by far, in, in terms of ongoing sustainability, the notion of teaching people, you know, how to fish rather than continue to give fish, is in our biomed training program. It, it really is because what, what happens with that equipment, we, we see that upwards of 70% of it, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, you know, equipment goes unused because it either lacks spare parts, you don't have instruction manuals, or people just afraid to touch it, you know, whatever, whatever it is, because they think they're gonna break it. And so one of the things we provide through our engineer, uh, and he's gone out to a number over 35 or 40 countries, where when we go out and we do, we conduct on-site training for about five days. Uh, so we'll, we'll ask them to bring all the broken equipment to the training and it doesn't have to be at the hospital. So we actually train them how to repair the equipment uh, in the hospital. It is unbelievable. Uh, the, often, the other thing we hear is that even if they wanted to repair it, they don't have the tools. And so we've come up with these maintenance kits with all the precision tools that they need to do the proper diagnostic and repair. So he takes the kit and he leaves the kit there. The other thing we've done, which I'm very proud of, we partner with a lot of the local technical institutions here in the U.S. to come up with troubleshooting guides. So we've identified the top 20 issues for equipment and they have a pictorial guide of what to do. How do you properly diagnose it? 
how do you, and so we make that available uh, with our shipments and the last thing and, and we're trying to expand even more uh, Evan our engineer is often on uh, chat rooms right and we try to do a lot of video you know conferencing in, in case in case they need help and and we just launched a, 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 a training in Ghana where we're going to be part of a local uh, training facility there that JMJ was sponsoring and they've invited us in to provide the BioMed curriculum as part of that. So they're doing a lot of procedural training and what they find out in doing the procedural training, they need the equipment, maintenance claim. And so we're doing that. And I, I just think by far, in terms of driving long-term sustainability, because if you can train an engineer or technician, in some cases an end user, how to properly use, maintain, and repair, then that gift will just continue to keep on giving for long, long periods of time. Yes, the beauty of it is, it isn't again just donating things that things that people don't need that, that that sit some sometimes out in front of the clinic. It's actually making sure that this stuff is really getting used, right. which is fantastic. And it, it could be just to follow up, and it could be very simple. We've had everything from make sure this band doesn't work to finding out it wasn't plugged in. Okay. <laughs> it could be make sure this ultrasound is giving erroneous readings and they haven't cleaned the probe, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't understand you have to, you know, so, and that's why I said they want the shiny toy, but a lot of times unless you have the training and expertise on proper usage and maintenance, probably not the best, but it does increase the quality of care for that facility, so it's hard to say no sometimes, but you just have to continue, continue to follow up. So we've talked a lot about um, equipment that goes to uh, other parts of the world with you know our, our efforts in global health. But a lot of times people say, well, geez, why, why are you doing all this stuff in other parts of the world? Don't we have needs here? What are we doing here? Right. Yeah, this is a paradigm shift, you know, in terms of, you know, I come out of the global health space. And when I say global, U.S. is included. But for some reason, when you say global to the U.S., they assume that they're not part of the globe. <laughs> it, it, baffles, it, baffles, it baffles my mind. But, but, but with that said, I, I do understand they're underinsured or no insurance, so they, you know, let it would fall through the cracks. So we support them. We allow them to come in, you know, to our facilities to pick a product free of charge uh, to provide care. In some cases, we actually build out. We were trying to market this safety net clinic in a box concept where we would come in and actually help them start it up. You know, here's an exam table, here's some gels, here's a stethoscope, here's some blood pressure cuffs, all the basic items they would need to start a club or up. And then obviously they would partner with the hospital to get the volunteer, uh, you know, docs and nurses to come by. And so we do that, and we are very proud of that, of that work that we do, but we do it as part of our primary care. So when I say global, uh, I, I'm meaning that's a part of it, but we have to be able to say it up front. And we want to expand, we want to do more. The need is just so great. Uh, and one of the things that I try not to do is compare needs. There's no end to that. Uh, you know, so we, we just say where there's need, uh, MedShare want to be very positioned. But now the other thing for MedShare, uh, typically what governs where we, you know, a lot of the product we get directly from the manufacturer, we can't send domestically, right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to create a black market. So they, they mandate that those products have to be sent internationally. Mm -hmm. And so the work we're doing for the safety net, we have to carve out that inventory. That's usually what we've collected from the hospital. But even where we get it from in the hospital, there's some regulations around mm -hmm. whether we can use it. So those are the only limiting factors. Uh, but besides that, yeah, we're really willing and able to work with our local you know, safe and extra clinics, because they, they really are treating those people, the marginalized communities that, that exist here, unfortunately, in the United States as well. So you've mentioned several times where the um, equipment came from, but I wonder if we could dive into that a little bit more deeply um, and, and talking about uh, not only how we collect it, but how, do, how we solicit the opportunity to sure. get the uh, equipment and then again, um, what some of these constraints are and limitations that are put on by the people who are donating it. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you a great example. I mean, beds, that's a, a one we depend heavily on. And usually it's a change out in a hospital. And I think most of you know beds are often leased in hospitals. And so, you know, when uh, Hill Rom comes in to deliver the new beds, what do you do with the old ones? Mm -hmm. uh, and they've got options there, right? They can sell them or give them back. And, and so we actually have developed a partnership now with Hill Rom that they are actually communicating you know, with the bed, with the hospitals to think about that share as you donate your bed. And that's been put in their publications and, and we hope to get, you know, beds. Uh, by and large, our equipment comes from the hospitals, 
whether it be through a decommissioning, like we went out here with some of the uh, Kaiser facilities, uh, where we collected a lot of a lot of equipment. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, we always look at percent of useful life uh, left on that equipment before they change it out. You know, with a little ingenuity and engineering, we can increase that useful life. And so we do that. So in our shop, we do a, quite a bit of repairs on, onto it, maybe changing things out to make it just like new. Uh, and now you just get a life, you know, to these communities that had not. Uh, we go into a hospital, you may be astounded to hear, I mean, maybe have one you know, portable ultrasound for the 500 bed hospital. And they're literally just trying to roll it around from room to room. So to give them another one, you know, you just double their capacity. You know, we see that uh, quite often. And, uh, you know, and that, that need never goes away. So, but, but by and large, our equipment, uh, we have equipment partners, but by and large, I would say from the hospitals to change outs of them getting the new model, uh, we take those old. A uh, great example, if you, everybody knows the IV stands, IV poles, right? We've got OSHA here. <laughs> and so those IV poles started out as three prongs. They're up to about six now. <laughs> right? And those threes were good. <laughs> but somebody wrapped a cord or whatever, they went from four to five. So, you know, the regulation in the U.S. says six, and I have all the three, fours, and fives. You know, so, <laughs> so we have those, those examples, and they, they're good. I mean, they're perfectly good. Uh, same thing as they make improvements in wheelchair technology, believe it or not. And uh, we find that some of the older models lends itself better to some of the terrain that, you know, our recipients would be using. So just a very, very ways. Yeah. Um, and so that brings me to ask you about the volunteer program yeah. because uh, a lot of stuff, I mean, it's one thing to get these, these big pieces of equipment that by and large the volunteers aren't that involved in, maybe yeah. biomedical is. But there's all sorts of other little stuff. There's uh, drapes and, and you, know, you know medical equipment that's used in the operating room. Just a whole ton of stuff. Tell us about the volunteer program and um, and how they are a part of this whole logistical um, supply chain that helps make this happen. Yeah, I mean, first of all, volunteers. Alpha, they're the heartbeat of our organization. I mean, without them, it, it just doesn't work. And, and as I explain our model in terms of our inputs, there's three things we need to make it go. One is the product, which I already talked about. We need funding, and the third are the volunteers, right? So the volunteers literally are the ones that come in. So imagine we've got this barrel at a hospital, and the hospital's just throwing everything in there. And we use these volunteers to go through every single item to get like items together so we can box it up and make it available to inventory. So last year, we had an all-time high of 22,000 volunteers is what we used last year, 22,000. But it's beyond that. It has kept, I think, MedShare tethered to our local communities. And it often provides a, a place for them. It's, it's, uh, it's more, it's, 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 it, they create clubs and kindred spirits, and a lot of them may be retired, and they look forward to coming to MedShare. And, and don't tell them they're not met here <laughs> because they will tell you otherwise. I mean, they have their t-shirts, they have groups that meet those. We have our, we have our Friday regulars and Wednesday regulars in the Southeast. I have my Thursday regulars, you know, out here and they've been coming for seven, eight years religiously and they look forward. So I think it helps them as well. Uh, it's a community effort that one of which we're very, very proud of. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, on the business side, it's a huge cost avoidance for us. If we had to prevent, we have to use that amount of labor into our process to do the work. We only have 45 staff. There's no way we could do it. So we, we really love our volunteers and, and, and it's really that mixed product that they're going through and meticulously, you know, putting together in a box, making sure the box is quality. They're asking those environmental questions, particularly here. You know, if it comes into mesh here, good luck trying to get out unless it be a repurpose for a good use, you know. And, and so they look at everything meticulously. And uh, again, I'm just very appreciative of all our volunteers. Uh, 22,000, let's say, that's a very big number. Very big number. It is a big number. And I'm really glad that, that you uh, brought up this idea of what the community, you know, creating this community of MedShare volunteers and the actual health benefit that that brings to our volunteers because some of them, you know, otherwise may be living more isolated lives and we now know that loneliness is actually a health risk factor. Right. So being able to give this opportunity, create a community, give people a sense of purpose is really, uh, really quite remarkable. Yeah, I mean, just to add on that, we've got a group that contacted me in New York. We have this maternal child health program and they said, well, we want to create moms for that share. 
we want to go for it. Moms for Mesha. I said, let's roll that out everywhere. You know? And this group of moms said, we want to show our support for MedShare, but we want to be branded as Moms for MedShare. That's that communal spirit, and they want to come in and volunteer. They want to work on a lot of our maternal child health things, the clean birthing kits, who you know, I talk a lot about that we, we offer. They want to come in and just put together a lot of those and, and show their support for, for other mothers. So I, I just think it's fascinating. It is indeed. And since you mentioned the birthing kits, yeah. um, why don't you talk a little bit about the program and in particular how some corporations are, are having, I guess, birthing kit uh, events yeah. uh, at their, at their uh, companies? No, sure. I mean, part of our, I mentioned maternal child health several times. Now, one of the things we launched this year, oh, a couple of years ago, was uh, what we call the Two Million Mothers Campaign. And, and really, two million mothers, unfortunately, is the number of mothers that watch their infants die within the first 48 hours, right? So we want the help. And, and what we found out is part of that uh, is happening in, in remote settings outside of the hospitals where deliveries are, are taking place due to infections. You know, it's impacting both the mother and the child. And we have this elegant solution called a clean birthing kit. And, and basically, if you don't know what it is, it's... Uh, it's a kit that, you know, basically can help mothers deliver a clean baby, right? Everything from a covering from the ground, a clean blade to cut the umbilical cord, there's a umbilical clamp on there, a pair of gloves, soap, wash your hands, uh, the bag for the placenta, and then we also added a, a diaper, a receiving blanket, there's a nose aspirator, and there's a cap, right? And so we provide these to these resource-stressed communities uh, and I see Pat back there, my traveling partner from Ecuador, and, and, and Sutter, one of the local hospitals here, was the first that said, we want to produce the first one. So they actually put together an event that produced the first 800. So my challenge to the organization was, let's do 100,000 of these. I want to ship 100,000 and cut that number in half because it was like, uh, no, that was 10%. It was a million mothers that were, and babies died for this reason. So I said, let's do 100,000. So the first 800 were put together. Uh, from Sutter, and we built upon that. Now we, we have these uh, clean birthing kit campaigns that uh, corporations want to get behind. So they give us a donation, and we'll actually take all the supplies out uh, to an office-based setting, and they put together, as a team builder, they put together these kits. So uh, I think we're up to, so we've gone past 800. Uh, <laughs> the high now, we're up to 2,000 kits in one setting. The average is right around 1,000, but it's just a great opportunity for people to get involved, uh, oftentimes they can't come out uh, to volunteer in one of our facilities, so we bring it to them. They're supporting our maternal child health program, and it is really, really has taken off. Uh, we've done a number of these now, and we have several others lined up. So if you're interested, <laughs> uh, see Eric, uh, we can certainly arrange to, to do more of that. But it's just such a special way, I think, particularly around you know Mother's Day is coming up and, and things like that. If people want to do uh, something in maternal child health, who can, who can say no? you know, to mothers and children. So that's that's the clean birthing kit. Um, that's wonderful. And uh, so I want to take a little bit of a left turn. Well, it's okay. actually not a left turn. Maybe it's just veering off a little bit. And talk about the medical teams. So I have two good friends who um, do a lot of volunteer work. Uh, one has been a jillion times to Guatemala and Bolivia, and another one goes on a regular basis to Nepal. And both of them, because when they go, they have to be sure that they have supplies so they can take care of people. The person who goes to Nepal goes to a very, very rural area where they have nothing. So they have to carry everything with them. Mm -hmm. And um, and they get their supplies from med chairs. So yeah. Can you talk to us about the medical team support? Yeah, sure. Again, part of the primary care program, one of the things, we, we don't commission the teams, uh, but we do provision them. Uh, basically meaning we may not have a say-so into when and where they're going, but often when they get ready to go, they contact us to make sure they have all the supplies. So if you go to our facilities, we have what we call these medical mission team stores. And basically it's like shopping. They can go in, they're gonna carry suitcases of items and they collect the loose items that they need. Uh, the nice thing about this, this also provides an opportunity for short dated product. Most of the product on our, our containers have to have a minimum of one year expiration life. We can do six months in the store because we know once they get it, it's going to be used, you know, immediately. And so, and we also we've evolved that. They usually have to come in. We'll you can do it online. Uh, you can call up and we'll box it up and have it ready for you uh, to pick up and take. The only restriction on that we don't ship it outside the U.S. Uh, we'll ship it in the U.S. for you to take, you know, outside the U.S. Uh, another you think unique thing we've been able to do here recently we partnered 
uh, with Delta Airlines flight attendants, uh, where they started taking supplies to the various countries in which the airlines. Mm -hmm. So they created a partnership with someone on the end, and they use their bags and everything. They stop by vet share, they fill it up, and, and they take the flight. And we just recognized them at an event we had in Atlanta called Nigeria Day uh, for organizing that. That was organized by the Delta uh, employee. So it's just it's just another way, and that's that nimbleness, I think, of our logistic model. It's not confined, confined to just a container. You've got these uh, medical mission teams that are oftentimes able to get into the even more remote reasons, regions that a, a container cannot go. And so you'll find them in, in a lot of different places that we probably never even ship, you know, ship to there to provide, you know, quality care. And it's interesting, and my friends who go will come back and say, oh, now I know I really need this other thing. Right. For example, my friend who came back from Nepal, Nepal recently said there was a huge need to have dental supplies, right? And a need to have electricity uh, to power some of the things that they were doing in the, in, the, in the dental region. So they bring information back to us that can help us think about you know, other things that we should be collecting or, or doing to support the work that they're doing. So I want to talk a, a little bit, Charles, about the environmental impact. We've mentioned it, but I want you to go into some detail about the magnitude of, of what's happening when we ship this stuff. It gets reused instead of going out and, and filling up the landfill. Yeah. Again, which is very fortunate. I think I mentioned a number, two and a half million pounds that probably just bounced off the walls. But that's a big, that's a big number. And upwards of about a million pounds of that is diverted from landfills here in the Bay Area. So that's a million pounds a year. Uh, so think about that. That's the magnitude of how much we're bringing in and repurposing it really to save lives. So what a, what a great story to be able to say I prevented these items from going into landfills here in the U.S. and I was able to save a life you know, here, you know, oftentimes it could be back in the U.S. And so that's long been a, a uh, part of our, our mission. It continues to be. Uh, it's just, uh, and I, I think the difference, and I, I just had this conversation was, you know, we often we often get the question, is our, is our model dependent on hospitals being inefficient, right? So what happens, you know, if they become more efficient? And that's really not the story. Uh, we want hospitals to become efficient, I think. The fact that we have these corporate partnerships, you know, still gives us. But I, I think we work in part. We're partnering with our hospitals, and we're part of that efficiency model for them. They, they don't look at us as a, a waste disposal. We're part of their redeployment of these items, and and that they know it's going to provide quality health care. So we're we're joined with our hospitals. We're not uh, one of these. Uh, they are. They exist. We're not a waste provider or waste <laughs> uh, picker upper. I like to say of. Uh, uh, for them, but we're really a partner. And so we understand the issues they face, they understand the needs we have, uh, and oftentimes we reach out to them uh, for items that they, they give it to us. But, you know, the core of it, Pat, as you mentioned, though, is really the environment, and, and in fact, just thinking that all of this stuff would end up uh, in a landfill, it's just a tragedy. And, and we're just happy that our model uh, is, a, is, a, is an opportunity to improve that, and, and at the same time, address, you know, the different global health disparities that we face, you know, around the globe. So, um, you see we do a lot of work. We do. You know, we've, got, we've got our fingers into a lot of pies. We're really a part of the healthcare ecosystem. Um, and that's a really good thing. But one of the things that um, people ask, usually when we ask them for donations, is, well, you know, this all sounds really good, but how do you know you're actually making a difference? When I first joined the council, we used to talk about how many how many shipments we made right. and how many pounds and all that kind of stuff. Charles, talk to us a little bit about how we're trying to move away from counting shipments right. to counting real impact at the level of the doctors, the hospitals, and most important, the patients. Right, and I have one of my board members here, uh, Sue Sprunk, uh, which she'll tell you this has been a long a passion you know, of mine. And, and part of the shift we've made as an organization is really to understand it's about people, not things. Right? And, and, and it's not about the shipments, the boxes, but it's about how those items are being used to address, to address health issues. And so some of the changes we've made to get at that, we've aligned this programmatic approach I keep talking about. We wanted to align our shipments to address the health issues. So we really look, 
and studied the sustainable development goals and understood what was the pressing issues and make sure that we aligned, you know, with them, which is why they are maternal child health, which is, you know, one of the goals and we've got the environmental component. And, and so that has helped us. So we are really trying to shift from, and I mentioned those inputs, right? So we, we created logic models around inputs, outputs, outcomes, and impact. We, we recognize that we cannot get to the outcome level on every shipment we make. You know, we can make up as of 140, 150 of these a year. It's just not, you know, possible. But there are things we could do in terms of talking more about the patients served, the number of physicians that we've equipped, the number of hospitals that we've improved, the, the economic impact, for example, that we can have on a hospital. Oftentimes our deliveries are budget offsetting that allow them to reinvest into the health system and strengthen the entire health system. So we've changed our language. And then on occasion when we can, you know, do a, a, a more detailed study, the one in which we, we just completed in, in Nicaragua uh, with one of our partners, Amos, where we combine some community-based health practices with uh, equipment and supplies in a remote setting that we were able to baseline, we were able to demonstrate we reduce more child mortality rates by 42%. You know, so, so those are the things that, and you saw your reaction, right? That's the same reaction I had. That means much more to me than tell me how many boxes that I sent there to know how they were used, the impact it had on those communities. Now I can go to another community or even a funder and say, here's what we able to do with high quality, metal supplies, equipment, addressed in this manner. Uh, and you know, and, and one of the stories that really impacted me out of that report, and I am a storyteller, so bear with me. Uh, but one of the stories that, that impacted me was they, 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 they told us that uh, there was a mother who had, she was pregnant and had uh, a number of complications and we had sent them an ultrasound and they were able to use the ultrasound to show that she was low in MBI fluid and they had to conduct an emergency C-section. So they got her help she need and saved both her and the baby's life. So those stories, you know, for me, that's what it's about. Well, I'm glad you told that story because it was going to be my next question. Oh. <laughs> I have plenty more. But that's okay. I have, but that, I, no, but that's, let me think. So I'm going to throw it open to the audience in, in a minute. Yeah. But what I wanted to do was just to close this part of the conversation by having you explain to us what it means to be a four-star charity. Because there are a lot of charities that w would really like to have that designation. And I don't know about you, but when I do my giving, it makes a difference to me that I'm giving to somebody, to an organization that I, I know has gotten that stamp of mm -hmm. approval. What's, what's behind that? What does it mean? What's that good housekeeping seal of approval stamp? Well, well, first of all, it's a very good thing, and, and I explained it, but to put it in perspective, recognize there are probably about 1.6 million registered charities uh, in the U.S. That's, that's a lot. And, but all don't qualify to be uh, evaluated by Charity Navigator. There's some criteria you have to make. I think you have to be, revenues have to be over a million dollars for seven years in a row. Uh, you have to have, uh, there's, there's a lot to even get you to the point where they can even evaluate you if they want. But they, they evaluate about 10,000 or so uh, charities a year. And, and so, and they look in, they, based on what they're assessing us on, on our financial uh, stability, uh, transparency, uh, they're looking at us they, that we publish a 990, we're open, we have a board, we have good governance in place, we publish our minutes, we have donor bill of rights. Uh, we're showing good use of, of our funds every year as it relates to putting it on our programmatic work. And, and so they have everywhere from a zero star up to four stars. And if you get four star, which we've now received for 13 years in a row, <laughs> that is the highest rating. Uh, that you can get for fiscal responsibility and operational transparency, which makes us very proud, but it puts us in the top 1%, the top 1% of all those charities when we say we have a four star. So it, it puts the donor mind at ease too. And, and we do get a lot of uh, donations through that where they see we're responding to a disaster, they go to Charity Navigator and they see we're a four star, and then they come to us. So it's a, it's a very good thing, one which we're, we're very proud of, uh, it takes a lot of work uh, to, to maintain that, but we just feel it's the right, it's the right thing to do. And, and again, we just uh, are so proud to 13 years in a row uh, of showing such high performance as an organization. Well, it, it's fantastic. And I, before we go to the questions, I just wanted to give you a round of applause. Oh, man. <laughs>
take questions now, and Bill, you're going to yeah. pass. We want everybody to speak into the mic. Okay, you are listening to a program of the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco with Charles Redding, CEO of MedShare, in conversation with uh, Pat Salber, discussing how MedShare provides medical supplies and equipment for global disaster relief. Uh, questions now? Charles, uh, when we were chatting just informally before the program, uh, you had shared with me some of your experience in just returning from Ecuador, and I think uh, the audience here would uh, really appreciate some of the insights and observations that um, had an influence on you and the other members of the group. And so I'm hoping you might just uh, highlight some of your experiences having just returned from Guayaquil. Sure. I mean, Pat was with me uh, from Sutter. Uh, we just got back, but uh, and I just wrote an article that I'll share. It's going to be, be published. Um, but I, you know, often so the trip. This is a trip we typically take. It's an opportunity for board members, council supporters, staff, you know, potential donors, to get a, a, a first-hand look at the impact of our work, and also to better understand, you know, current conditions as it relates to healthcare. So, you know, we just got back from Rock Hill, uh, where. You know, I, as I stated, I was both uh, amazed, I mean, shocked, uh, intrigued, and, and amazed. And, and what we were shocked about, I was shocked to see that, you know, they had leprosy, they were still treating leprosy patients in the middle of the city. That shocked me, um, that, that, that that still exists. Yet, the people we encountered in the clinic were so happy and very appreciative for all the support that people, particularly outside of uh, Ecuador, continue to give them. It was just an uplifting experience. I, I also was shocked uh, to see that you had this girl orphanage where uh, up in the in the Andes, uh, they had this, uh, these girls, which in some cases the family had decided they could no longer care for them. In other cases, they were removed from the home because of abuse. And they found refuge on a teddy bear. Each one had a teddy bear as a constant reminder that they weren't alone, you know. And we really, you know, began to think about what can we do, you know, to support, you know, these young girls. Uh, I think, you know, we were further intrigued, at least I was, uh, we, we visited this remote community that was really centered around a sugarcane factory, it's called San Carlos. And this company had taken upon itself to provide quality health care, not only uh, for the employees of the facility, but also their families and the families of the community. <laughs> And so we got a chance to uh, witness a, a wheelchair ceremony where they had invited people that had been afflicted and they provided wheelchairs, which for them were a lifeline. And it gave them the gift of mobility, many of which had none. And so that, I was intrigued by how a company can be a part of the health system and provide that, you know, that, that, that kind of help. Uh, you know, I was, I was amazed, too, at the quality of some of the hospital we, we saw. Uh, we visited some that were just as good as any I could see here in the U.S. And it had come through the government mandate that we would provide 100% free health care to every citizen of Ecuador, regardless of economic status. And they turned it over to one of our partners to run a, run a public section of the health care. And what a phenomenal job they did. I mean, we went to a pediatric hospital, state of the art. They had just finished a maternal child health hospital, state of the art, and, and they took great pride to always tell us that we're serving both. <laughs> you know, we were, we were serving both. And, and so it, it always impacted me. I, I still left, though, you know, there were some things going on there with the uh, uh, change in the government that a lot of the progress they had made it could particularly be unraveled, you know, just with a change. So it's a constant reminder to me of how fragile these communities are and how connected they are with their leader. And that one change can undo a lot of progress. And and I also, you know, had my, I still wondered, you know, there's still the folks that we have supported during the earthquake that were in the very remote regions, outside the cities, you know, just how much care are they getting and, and what role we can continue to play, you know, for that. So that, that was my perspective, Paul. Thank you for having uh, that. I think I hit it all, Pat. It was probably more. <laughs> First time you heard me talk about it as well, and you were with me. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind making a comment. You, you have a mic? Or? Thank you. I think the thing that impressed me, because it was the first time I had taken a, a trip like that, was really the complexity of the work on the ground and the 
the how important the partnerships are. I just had visions of you know a, a container goes there and people get what they need, but if it wasn't for that partnership that you developed there, um, there the the people who suffered from the uh, the earthquake would not have gotten the supplies that they needed. So it was really quite eye opening for me. Thank you. I want to congratulate you on four stars. I know it's really hard to get at Sheridan Navigator. But I do have a question, 22,000 volunteers. How do you um, screen them and train them and do the administrative work for them and when necessary deploy them? Yeah. Yeah, so, so first of all, our volunteers are very focused on activities related to the mission. So we don't have them doing a lot of other things. So they all are basically doing the same thing. They're all coming in and being able to sort through products and, and get them into uh, the right order. Uh, so how we do it, we use a combination of very highly trained staff uh, to oversee it as well as, and we have training protocols around everything. Uh, and also we use some of our more experienced volunteers who have been doing it for a number of years. And so that's how we maintain that, that continuity. Uh, but it's very scripted. Uh, I think, you know, from the moment a volunteer comes in, there's a messaging that they receive, there's a video, there's a tour. They understand it's more, it's not about those things. They talk to them about the patients' lives that are going to be impacted. So it's a very formal uh, process that each volunteer goes through. And so our, we, we volunteer primarily Tuesday through Saturday. So they're in three hour segments, uh, you know, three shifts at a time. And so we manage it for a focused, you know, three hours uh, on a particular activity. And we, we vary it based on whether it's an experienced volunteer or, or a new volunteer, meaning uh, we do a number of sorts. The first sort is just, if I were to tell you, I've got all these different types of sutures, put all the sutures in one bucket. So that would be a basic, and so new volunteers do a lot of that. Now my next question is, let's put all the like sutures and sizes together. Right? That's a little bit more complex. And so we ask our more experienced volunteers to do that second sort. And then we have upwards of 10 points of quality checks that we do. Everything from verifying the expiration dating, the content, the quantity, the weight, uh, all that gets checked through, through the process. So it's complex is the right word. It's, it's very involved, uh, but it's a combination of those staff and volunteers going through that process. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, just logistics. It sounds like it's a very complicated thing to ship stuff all over the world, and especially during a disaster. Um, and I know a lot of other organizations don't have that capacity. And it sounds like developing partnerships and on the ground, and you know who you, you know who needs to get the stuff. Can can you talk a little bit about how that's developed and? what some of the lessons learned on how to have effective disaster logistics, because even in the Bay Area here, you know, up at North and the fire up North, I mean, that was less than 20 miles from here and people sure. did not, I mean, no one knew what was going on. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it actually, it, we've changed our model. I think the focus really need to be on disaster preparedness, mm -hmm. right? And so you're, you're in a position, you're prepared prior to the disaster, because often if this, you wait till disaster occur, it's too late. And so some of the things we've done around preparedness, number one, we've developed that disaster response protocol, which kind of govern us in terms of uh, how and if we would respond. But I think even more importantly, we have sort of a standard supply list that we've developed that's common across all disasters. We've developed a common group of partners that we can reach out to uh, and when a disaster. And also we have begun to fundraise prior to disaster. So by creating a program, uh, we reach out our partners to support our programs. And so with funding and partnerships and products and pilots and protocol, we're often in a better uh, position. We have uh, something we didn't have at first, we have airline partners, you know, we, we, uh, that we can reach out to. If you know we're not first responders, we want to get it there as quickly as we can. So that, that helps us uh, quite a bit. And I mentioned, you know, UPS and some of the others. So all these partnerships, and I think Pat mentioned it, they're so critical. We can't do it alone. You know, we don't have a fleet of planes. And we also have implementing partners, meaning we partner with other organizations that have people on the ground that we can, like the AmeriCares and some of those international relief, that we can send supplies to and they're in a position to distribute them on, on the ground. So that's, so preparing to shift it from response to preparedness, I think is the key 
uh, to effective disaster relief. Yeah. Okay. I've got a question. Does MedShare uh, providing relief in conflict zones or in war zones? You know, uh, we do. Often it's, uh, it's tricky. Uh, to give you an example, uh, for us, we've had a request for Somalia, uh, which is the Horn of Africa, very difficult. And we've had to ship by way of Dubai and truck it all the way over, you know. So it's not that we don't want to. We find often that the, the need is there. It's just that safety still, you know, is a concern not only for us, but the freight forwarders. Uh, so a lot of times we're governed by where they will go. And, and so there's reluctance for the freight forwarders to go into some of these areas, and so we can't we can't get things there. But if we can, uh, we certainly we certainly try. I think it's uh, one question per person. <laughs> I'll take the usual route. It's a two part. One. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a lot of journalists doing that. <laughs> Just one simple question that will give me a lot of insight. How do you know what we shipped to, say, Puerto Rico got used? It's several months now since we shipped them. Right. Once I know the story, many things will become obvious. And the second part or corollary coming from what you said just now, Charles, is how do you plan for the future? Like, the needs that are going to come year, two years, three years down the road, is there a conscious effort of trying to foresee what might be our activity going forward, what kind of supplies, what kind of stuff that we can do, for the lack of a better word, a couple of years down the road. Sure. And I'll do like they do on TV. I'll answer your second question first, and then I'll go to the end. <laughs> no, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. In fact, uh, uh, Sue will tell you, we just finished our strategic plan uh, rebuild. So we had a, we, we create a strategic plan. We just finished five years of that, and, and we do take a look at it to understand if there are opportunities that perhaps we have missed. And, and we did talk about maybe some things out on the horizon we could consider. Not, we never committed, but things like telemedicine, things like, you know, different technological support systems that perhaps we could tap into to develop greater partnerships. Yeah, so those things we explore. Uh, but, you know, what we find is, is just balancing that with what these communities can handle. Uh, because if you're talking about remote communities that don't have electricity, don't have then there's no sense talking about, you know, how's your Wi-Fi connection. Mm -hmm. However, we, we always amaze, and I use Coca-Cola as an example, no matter where I am in the world, I see a kid with a Coke. <laughs> so they figured out how to get <laughs> Coke to the most remote regions, and it just happened in Ecuador. I, I mean, we had, I even had Coke Zero in Ecuador. <laughs> and, and so partnerships like that, you know, stand connected. They always talk about the last mile. So I think that's where we are, really that last mile of, Delivery. Uh, one of our partners, like UPS, are evaluating drones. You know, so they got drone for blood delivery. So we we try to stay up to those and evaluate it. Uh, in terms of I, I, the first question I touched on earlier was that we create the, the partnerships is the reason we know. Uh, so in a case like Puerto Rico, we asked for a survey on the usage and how to use the product and things like that. Uh, and then we can tell by reordering patterns, you know, whether or not. But for every shipment to Puerto Rico, we know it went exactly to the hospital that we designated. And because we follow up and make sure that that, and we relied on our partners to do it. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it's not a blind leap of faith, but I, I think if you do as much as you can to evaluate them up front, create the partnerships, know who you're dealing with, at that point you know those products are getting there. And, and the only follow up to that is, what's the story? I like for, I ask each one for a story. Tell me a story of how you use this product to impact the lives of one of your patients. That to me uh, means so much more than them telling me how every box, you know, was used in that used in that hospital. And so that's the way we try to approach it. I'm Bill Grant, co-chair of the uh, club's uh, health and medicine member of the forum. We thank uh, Charles Redding and Pat Silver for their comments here today. We also thank our audiences here as well as those listening to the recording. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, commemorating more than 115 light years of enlightened discussion, is adjourned. Thank you guys for the question, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> as a representative of a, a disaster-prone country, I wanted to ask you about, is there an effort to work with the governments that, you know, first in those countries that yes. inevitably will be hit in the future? Yeah, I mean, that's part of what we do. In fact, I just wrote a letter to the new president of Liberia on that, just trying to figure out how we can partner with them on, you know, disaster readiness, particularly for the next outbreak. So it's not a question of if, it's when. And we felt that if we can work with them on making sure they have the right amount of personal protective equipment in place, uh, that would improve their chances. And also just different ways of strengthening the uh, health system. So we want to focus on maternal child health and those cleaning birthing kits. But we do, so a lot of our work is direct with governments. There's a risk uh, when you do that, uh, but when we can, it's like when you go to somebody's house, you wanna get permission. And so wherever we go, we at least want the Minister of Health to be aware that we're there and the type of work we're doing and making sure it's aligned with the priorities of that country. And, and our model is helping them help themselves, not going in and telling them what they should do. And the only way we can do that uh, is to work with that with that Minister of Health. It also helps with the measurement because if the Minister of Health is already measuring these, then you're just linking it to it and you're not creating a, a whole separate, you know, measurement system.